Why, hello there. This is an attempt at a process pod. I've tried to record it a couple of times, but it's gone rambling. It's a little hot in here. That's not helping. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is this Friday, Comics Jam time. Uh, we're doing, hosting another Comics Jam, a monthly Montreal Comic Jam, via Zoom and Agi. Check out the description text for a link to the Facebook event page. Um, there's also a mailing list that's linked to down there. You have either option. If you don't like the Facebook monster, you can use the mailing list. I will put out the information to join on Agi uh, about an hour before the event. So it's a 7 o'clock event, 6, six o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. I will send out the, uh, the Zoom information, and you're welcome to join in if you're a cartoonist or if you're just interested and want to hang out. It's a social event. A Comics Jam is basically a gathering of cartoonists in a, frequently a bar or a cafe or something like that. And we sit around and we do improv comics. Someone does a panel, they pass it on to the next person. They do a panel, they pass it on to the next person. Eventually you end up with a, a page. Sometimes they're silly, sometimes they fall apart. That's okay. It's more about the play and the socializing, but also uh, for me when I first encountered jams in the early 90s, um, it was a, a kind of therapy. I was dealing with creative bottlenecking that was happening from doing commercial work for Marvel and DC. And uh, it gave me a way to play, but also see other ways and solutions to dealing with things, working with other cartoonists, and reminded me why I actually liked making comics and, and formed a big part of why I decided to move away from doing commercial comics too in the late 90s. Um, by the early aughts, 2001, I started hosting them monthly in Montreal. I did that for about four years and then retired. And uh, I would attend them occasionally, but I kind of stopped going to them for a long time there, even though I'm still an advocate. Um, but the crew of people that took it over from me put it to bed and stopped hosting them about a year or two ago. And so it's a bit of a void. There were other jams in Montreal. But then this whole COVID quarantine thing happened, and I felt like it was a great time to bring it back. And I saw the Vancouver Comic Jam, uh, which was founded by a guy who got the idea from from Rupert and the Toronto Monthly Comic Jam. Um, and uh, Rupert in Montreal used to host the jams here. And I used to go to the monthly comic jams in Toronto. I, I didn't run them, but I helped kick them off by hosting a one-off a jam that was Rupert and a bunch of people from Montreal at the Hyperbar in Toronto in like 96, I think. And uh, I think Jason Turner was there and he went to Montreal Comic Jams and then he went off and founded the monthly jams in Vancouver when he moved there. Um, or actually, he didn't found them. Ed Bryson was, didn't he? And then Jason took it over. I think Ed Bryson founded them. Anyway, meandering again. Um, jams are good. Their games are fun. Go check out the Salon BD Montreal website. That's also going to be in the description text. The uh, information about that and the history is there. Uh, the last two jams that I've hosted via Zoom and Agi, the art that was made is posted as well, and information for the Facebook page and all that stuff, all there. And there'll be a link to the Facebook event page and a link to the mailing list. Hope to see you there. It'll be tomorrow, Friday, the 5th, 7 p.m. Excuse me. 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. In other news, um, kind of related to that, a reminder, making comics at Sin Studio with me, all good Sam. I believe still open for sign up. We're about a week or two away from when they go to full price, so you can get a discount right now if you if you sign up at this time. It's all online, so anywhere you have a decent internet connection, you can join us. And it's a comprehensive, intensive dive into the process of making comics. You can come to it as a complete novice, with no history of making comics, just interest, but be prepared to, to do some work. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty deep topic. It's complex. So, uh, or if you are a practitioner, but you want to refine your work, we, we list it as a beginner class because I, I start with the basics and build up there. But we do that very quickly. Uh, and I think that anyone even more advanced will find that there's a lot to learn. And particularly if you're self-taught, we're going to go through a lot of things that quite possibly you may have missed along the way. That's usually the benefit of a class, even for, and I'm mostly self-taught. Um, but I've always, especially as I get older, I've always been interested in workshops and things because it usually introduces and fills in blanks, introduces us to ideas and fills in blanks of things that we've, we, we didn't know about. And I think my courses, I try to pack a lot into it, maybe sometimes a little too much. And so I think it's very much going to be uh, of use to both beginners and practitioners who want to broaden and enrich their, their practice. Um, I think it's a little over 400 Canadian. And... Uh, yeah, anywhere you have a decent internet connection and a web camera and ability to scan your art and learn to participate in terms of the tools, um, you can join in. You don't have to be here in Montreal at all. 
Hope to see you there. Um, I'm only teaching the one class next semester, which presents a challenge. It, it cuts my income in half. So I'm also going to open up doing more online um, tutoring, one-on-one, -on -one, and classes through Patreon. So patreon.com slash salgood. If you go there and join up for a $10 a month student patron, uh, comics or just drawing, you can uh, tell me that what it is you want to learn if you're just looking to refine your drawing or if you want to work on a particular aspect of your drawing or if you want to explore the medium of comics but at a slower pace um, than we would do it at a 10-day. So the, the course is 10, 10 weeks, uh, one, one day a week for three hours uh, per class. But then there's lots of homework, so you wouldn't just be working that much. You would, you would also have lots of stuff to do on your own. Um, but if you want to go to a slower pace and not spend that much money, the Patreon's probably a good channel for you. And you always have the option of giving me more money for like hourly tutoring to go beyond what the Patreon covers. But it'll give you uh, one... I'm not a stickler about it, so it's not always an hour, but one session with me, probably via Zoom, where we look at your work. And so at the first let's start, I'll get you to send me stuff, and I'll have some time to look at it before we meet up. And then I'll meet you on a video conference call. And we'll go over it and figure out what it is you want to improve and what I'm seeing. And I'll have a list of recommendations for things to study and, and links and resources. And then I'll send you off. And then when you're ready, we'll meet up again. You're entitled to it once a, once a month um, to have one hour with me. And then if you want more time, I'm available and I reduce my rate for patrons. So um, that's another option, another way for you to do it. And I'm definitely, I, I've been re reluctant. I was sort of doing it a little bit for a while there, but I found it a lot of work to manage more than one or two students myself. And I didn't even have that many, but even a couple I had were, it was like a lot of it ends up being reminding people, you know, and uh, chasing fo folks down and stuff like that. And then when I wasn't doing that, I felt bad I used to charge more for the Patreon cat class, and I felt bad if they weren't utilizing it. Um, so I reduced the fee to just ten bucks a month, and that feels a bit more balanced. If you if it's up if you want to give me that money and then not really follow up, I feel less bad about you not taking advantage of the opportunity. Um, and then there is always that option if you if you want to do it and there's you want to use it much more, we'll work that out. I mean it's 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 availability pending, but I especially with the reduced number of classes I'm teaching. I will be very available for more work. So let me know if you're keen. Um, in other news, a, two, a few days ago, I posted a non-process pods. You'll notice in, the, in it there's not one of these little logos. It's not my, my personal process pod. It was just a random statement about the shit going on in the world these days. Specifically... I come from a kind of far left background myself, and uh, I don't associate or, or affiliate with any particular group, but I would say that my politics would still on the political compass be on the far left. I once did one of those political compass things, and I was just a little bit south of Buddha. Uh, is it Buddha? No, the Dalai Lama. Sorry, the Dalai Lama. Um, yeah, which made me laugh. Because um, I'm not a pacifist, and that would imply that I was a bigger pacifist than him. Uh, but, yeah. I grew up with radical pacifism, so that I make sort of makes sense. And I actually grew up with a lot of Buddhism, and, and along with so I wasn't religious. We never went to temple, but my family is all Russian Jewish, and so there's a lot of Talmudic teachings. Talmudic? Am I saying that right? I don't know today. Um, and but also a great deal of um, Zen and Buddhist philosophy floating around, along with other Eastern Eastern ideas. We had a couple friends who converted to, I think it was Hinduism and a lot of folks who were into uh, transcendental meditation. Yeah. Um, so all sorts of interesting stuff and not a lot of conventional religious training, but a lot of very interesting uh, from a point of view of someone living in a largely wasp dominated Catholic community who was raised outside of any temple and told to like, you know, people believe lots of things, go figure it out for yourself. Um, that was more or less a summary of what my father told me. Um, I would definitely still identify on somewhere on the radical left. And that video I posted was, from that point of view, suggesting people question their use of symbols and how they enact them. And if you're going to be uh, engaging and uh, joining arms with people like uh, protesters uh, and Black Lives Matter protests, to really think twice about just uh, throwing on the garb and of a uh, black block or Antifa if you don't consider that there are obligations that goes with those concepts. Um, those aren't organizations. You can't 
call them Trump terrorist organizations because there's no central organization, but they are ethos, and they aren't. Their first order is not to start a fight with the police. <laughs> <laughs> it's not what they're about. Um, it's certainly a thing that they might do. If police brutality is off the hook, then uh, both Antifa and Black Bloc uh, considered it a very uh, a top priority to step between peaceful protesters and the, the violent fascists or the violent police and take that blow and fight back maybe, but also offer aid. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of classic Antifa organization uh, involved doing things like setting up first aid stations and water stations and things along a protest route and being there to organize the protests. If, ever, if, if fascists don't show up or the police don't, don't overstep their bounds and start being violent, Antifa still has a job. They're usually the people who plan and organize or they work with the organizers and they're usually peppered throughout the protest line, sort of keeping an eye on things and making sure everyone's okay. And if there's some sort of chant, they help carry the chant, like they'll call it out and get the, or if there's a clapping routine or something, they'll act as sparks to get that wave to happen. Um, they're there to coordinate, they're there to facilitate, they're there to help make things happen and act, help the uh, Black Bloc and Antifa both have ideas about helping make this group of individuals act as though it was a cohesive organism. And it's very high-minded stuff. And it's certainly one of the things that they do is being prepared to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and be uh, uh, what they need to be in the face of violent fascists or violent police. Um, but that isn't what they're about. And so I see people getting into crazy body armor that looks like stormtroopers or young kids not even doing the black block thing, but just sort of obviously wearing whatever they had and covering their faces and going and enacting violence and then justifying it by saying, well, that's, you know, it's corporate, it's commercial, it's capitalism. Well, no, it's a fucking community and it's that community protesting in their community and you're smashing it. You're as much a problem as the, the, the police violence at that point. And if you blindly associate with these badges and then do that, you're dishonoring the traditions, first of all. Maybe you don't care because you're against tradition, but you are. You're not helping. You're also not helping the protest. And you're being self-serving and speaking from a position of privilege. Anyway, I did that video. And what I wanted to say is a lot of folks in the comments, not a, a lot of folks were like supportive and cool, but a lot of folks in the comments, one of the very first comments was, oh, we watch out artists who go say political stuff, you know, they lose their followings. Okay, first of all, I've always been political, so anyone who actually knows me knows that. Uh, my art, part of the reason I stopped working for Marvel in DC is that I felt there was no room for my own voice, and I didn't like some of the things I was being asked to do. There were definitely creative reasons. I didn't like the editorial policy. I didn't like the amount of, the lack of room given to develop concepts and ideas and stories. I feel like groups like Comicsgate, and again, that's one of those groups. It's really an ad hoc organization of individuals. Um, and a lot of them identify the same problem, that there is not enough room left in the commercial uh, monthly comic cycle to develop work to make it good. But then they blame it on the political narratives in the stories. That's not the problem. The politics in the stories is never the problem. The fact they made an X, Y, or Z character or a person of color or gay or a woman is not the fucking problem. The problem is that the writers and artists aren't given enough room to breathe and think about stuff and develop it and germinate it. The problem is that the editorial culture is a production line culture. It's not actually creative editorial. Creative editorial culture, from word go, is back and forth with the writers and the artists, pushing them to do better work, telling them to, like, don't meet the deadline, but, or telling, not, not saying to them, always meet the deadline, always meet the deadline, but saying, this is good, but you can do better. Here's some ideas about maybe what we could try. We don't see that working from Marvel DC very much. I'm sure there's a few exceptions. You're going to find people, in the, there might be people in the comments who are like, I worked at Marvel and their editor was great. Good, great for you. The reality is the, the dominant uh, editorial culture when I worked there, it was mostly about dating deadlines. It's all they really cared about. And then uh, I know that that's still an issue. I know several people who still work in the business. And you know some of them have decent experiences, but a lot of them... They will say, yeah, it's about meeting the deadline mainly for the editors there. And I think that's the dominant editorial culture. And then with literary comics, it's still, it's a different issue, but you still see editorial culture there that's more about proofreading, you know, polishing off a thing. 
uh, or worse, sometimes telling the artist what they should do. You should do this with your thing. And I, I just was a part of a workshop with Georgia Weber that uh, was interesting. I learned a few things, but also just was sort of an aff affirmation that we agree about certain things. And I think what's really missing in comics is an editorial culture that focuses on uh, being a partner, a creative partner with the creators and developing ideas and s being an audience and suggesting to them how the work could be improved, but not saying, you should do this. Here's It's more like, I see this, and here's a thought about how that might be improved. You don't see that. That's the real problem. That's what people like Comicsgate miss. Um, and art is always political. So the folks who were warning me in my video uh, a couple days ago about going political, well, thanks for your concern, but really what you're doing is engaging in peer pressure, sort of a social pressure against self-expression. It's like telling a pretty girl, I said in the comments, that you shouldn't be too smart, or at least seem too smart, because boys might like might like you. This is assuming, for for one thing, uh, uh, a, a cisgendered normalcy, which I've had many lesbian friends tell me that it makes them laugh. Because, brother, they're not worried about that. Uh, however, um, even when we're talking about a straight woman, it is the worst kind of thing to do. And it's also the worst kind of thing to say it to an artist, to say, careful, you might lose your audience. You're trying to use the economic and um, it communicative. Like, so a lot of us as artists aren't necessarily prioritizing economics first. A lot of us are trying to express ourselves and talk and share ideas. And you're, you may not be outright censoring it, but you're using peer pressure to get them to censor themselves. And I'm going to tell you, that's kind of inappropriate. I, most of the time, I just laugh and ignore it. But I answered to a couple people in that video because it was a political video. So I was like, no, I'm going to make this a political video. This is a statement. And you're telling me that I shouldn't. Is you trying to shut me down? You may not think you're trying to. You might think you're being benevolent and warning me about the risks. I'm perfectly aware of the risks. I'm almost 50. Okay? I know. Uh, some people might tune me up because I dared talk about something political. Uh, I had a couple people, I pro I don't know if they ever watched me before, but start going in and harassing me about it. They saw another mask, and I, uh, no, I saw another video about where I, I was modifying a mask for COVID, and he started railing on that because of, and I assume, because it happened right after the video two days ago, that it was related to that. I just block him. I don't give a fuck. I'm so past giving a fuck. If you can't stomach my politics, well, then you can't stomach my comics because they're in it. If you're just here for the drawing videos, well, that's fine. But that's not all I am. I'm not a bimbo, okay? Don't try to make me into one. Uh, I come from a very radical left background. I am, I've been told I'm hyper-intellectual. I'm very interested in things. I was gonna say I'm very curious and knowledge-oriented. I'm a science fanboy. I actually wanted to be a scientist as a kid and then was sort of discouraged because I'm dyslexic from pursuing that. So I went into the arts, which my mother did, and I had lots of other family members in the arts. But I've always had that intellectual knowledge oriented focus in my life and um that is a part of who i am and it's a part of my work and if you didn't see it you weren't looking and if you haven't seen it because you weren't looking you're just watching my youtube videos because you like to watch people draw and you want to learn some lessons that's fine you don't have to watch my political videos no one's forcing you to watch them all you don't even have to unsubscribe you can see a video coming up and go oh he's talking about that and switch to the next thing but don't get into my comments or DM me and warn me about being political. I am a political creature. We all actually are. That's the secret. Your doing that is political. Your act of warning me about being political is a political stance. To be clear, let's define politics for a second. A lot of people walk around thinking politics is corruption or all the hostility and conflict or uh, you know business and corporate stuff. Or, you know, they want to compartmentalize it off and say, it's this thing, and it's separate from me. I can just make art and consume art and never be political. That notion is a political statement. The truth is, politics, in fact, is everything humans do as a society collective whole. Everything that we do, where we have to negotiate how we're going to do it together. That's politics. 
there are different kinds of politics. There's, there's business politics around business, politics about civil infrastructure, there's politics about policing, there's politics about war, there's politics about peace, there's politics about the environment, there's politics about sex and gender and identity, there's politics about liberties and freedoms. You name it, there's politics about it because everything we do that we have to do with other people involves an element of politics, it involves an element of negotiation, about consensus building, or, unfortunately, authoritarianism sometimes, where we don't bother to build a consensus, we just tell everyone else, this is what we're doing. You don't like it, fuck you. And sometimes it actually becomes a little bit necessary. I feel like the COVID crisis is a good example of a situation where you can't ever say anything is all bad. Every once in a while, sometimes, we're forced for the better collective good to do something that is fundamentally a little authoritarian like tell everyone you know what you may not like it but you need to wear a mask so that you can keep the, be sure to keep the germs in you not to protect you from other people's germs because we don't have enough of those masks and it probably wouldn't work anyway because people touch things and say and it can go in your ears and it's just impossible to keep them all out but what you can do is once they're in you you can take advantage of the fact that the primary viral tech tactics for shedding germs is coughing and sneezing by putting a mask on but when you cough and sneeze, sneeze, it doesn't spread. And if everyone was wearing a mask, uh, I remember reading somewhere about 80-something 80, 80 percent of the vi viral load in the air would disappear. Most of the countries that have been acing, flattening the curve and dealing with COVID, they didn't even necessarily go into full quarantine. They just made sure everyone wears a mask, mandatory, everyone gets tested, and all tests that have come up positive are backtracked and traced. So we know everyone they, they contacted with. They quarantined people who were affected. And they even did it like, so I was like, oh, well, I'm really sad. just going to be in my house. Well, no. So first of all, hopefully your house is, is somewhere where you can stay. And it's good. You're not in another group of people there that are at risk. Um, but places that have done this, they usually make sure that your means are taken care of. There's some great, you know, go look on Instagram or social media. You'll find stories of people who were stuck in other countries and surprised when, when someone in South Korea was quarantined and bags of food from the government were showing up at their doorstep to make sure they were sought after, they were, they were seen after, right? They were taking care of them. It wasn't fasc fascistic, but it is a little authoritarian. They're saying, I'm sorry, in this particular moment, you do not have the liberty to take this risk with other people's well-being. So we're going to make you have to stay here, but we're going to treat you well. We're going to make sure you're, you're okay. And uh, they, they took co-opted hotels. They did whatever they had to do to try and make it work. A lot of Western societies... America, Canada, other places, were a little hit and miss about pulling, pulling that off well. Um, some have tried to be too slack, like Sweden. Other people have been too heavy-handed. Uh, America can't make up its damn mind. Canada, not bad, but here in Montreal we're blowing it bad because we got a terrible leadership. Um, the, On the whole... That requires, uh, unless we conceive of a different system that allows for functional direct democracy, direct participatory democracy, and newsflash, direct participatory democracy is another word for socialism or communism. I know that doesn't go against everything you guys are taught in the States, but actually that's what socialism and communism looks like in function. When it's done right, I don't mean Russian communism. The, the Soviet communism, that wasn't communism. Um, you know... I don't want to get too off into this, this tangent, um, but that's kind of one of the points of my, my political rant, is that uh, a lot of people don't understand these badges and symbols and, and what they're about. And a lot of them have, have acquired really negative connotations. And if you're going to enforce those negative connotations by misbehaving while wearing those badges, you're not helping. You're not helping the Black Lives Matter protest, and you're not helping the image of Antifa or Black Bloc by being a dumbass and just picking fights randomly or burning down a local business that has nothing to do with the problems in, on, uh, on the plate or helping the local community. Um, every single violent revolution in history, including the American Revolution, led to strong men power coming in and imposing their rule. And I'm sorry, but no radical left uh, violent revolution, no tearing down the system, is likely to out come with a different outcome because trying to get millions of people to focus is really hard and the way it usually gets done is through charisma strongmen demagogues 
And so what happened in Russia was that there was a lot of socialism and communism floating around. A lot of people were into it. I think Lenin might have meant well, but there were a lot of problematic aspects to his particular set of dogmatic ideas. He was definitely a, 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 an original founder of the concepts of communism, but not the founder. And he had a very radical, violent notion about how they would work, and so did Stalin, who was a street thug, um, who rose to the ranks and saw an opportunity. Um, neither of them, and nor Mao, nor uh, what's-his-face from Venezuela, I can't remember his name right now, None of these guys in practice actually enacted a, a socialist or communist system. What they did was have a totalitarian state that called itself. They ripped the labels off these ideas and slapped it on an authoritarian state. And none of them were direct democracies. Not really. If we could find a system, a way to build a system of direct, direct democracy, that would be fabulous. But it's not going to happen through violent revolution. It just isn't. It's just not how it works. Um, and I think that that's... That's one of the biggest problems with all of that. Uh, but it needs to be talked about, and I, I do talk about it. I, one of the stories I'm working on in my comics, uh, New Armageddon Blues, is all about that at its core. Spoilers. Um, dream life, not quite the same, but there's a lot of politics in it. Therefore, repent. Absolutely political. Go talk to Jim about that sometime, but I was a co-creator in there, and I can tell you for sure. Um, my comics has always been political. So for those of you who are trying to warn me about being political, maybe you're on the wrong channel. Just saying. If you want to watch my drawing videos, you can keep doing that. And and I'm not going to like flag my videos the, to warn you that they're always political when they're political. But if I start talking about it and you're interested, I'm not going to take it personally if you decide to change the channel. But don't come in and tell me to be a bimbo and not talk about politics, okay? I mean, I can't stop you from doing it, but I'm going to ignore you or mock you, just so you know. Uh, anyway, I gotta go draw. If I haven't mentioned it already, patreon.com slash salgood. You can become a patron, just read my comics for about two bucks a month. A little bit more, I'll give you a portrait uh, a couple times a year for social media. I gotta catch up on those. I, I'm way behind on commission. Sorry about that, folks who, who are waiting on some. But I will happily take on more. Uh, and then student patrons, $10 a month, and uh, I can try to help you draw better. And I don't, you know, sometimes I, I ramble about politics when I'm teaching, but on the whole, that's just about teaching. Um, I guess just be warned that uh, if you're from a far left radical right political perspective, we probably wouldn't be a good mix as a student and teacher. Um, duly noted. The, the future is looking complicated. I don't think this is the end of the world. It's an inflection point. And the problem with inflection points like wars is that we don't know exactly what the outcome will be. Don't try, try not to be too pessimistic because often I don't believe in like, you know, think what you want and it'll come to you. If I think about money, I'm not going to see bags of money on my doorstep right away. But I do think collectively as a society, if we are too pessimistic, we will walk into and play out the rituals of the worst case scenario because we assume they're true. So to that end, facing all of the strife and conflict that we are right now with a global pandemic and, oh yeah, global warming's still a thing and all the rest, it would be really easy to feel pessimistic right now. I'm going to try to encourage everyone right now to say, hey, go make art. Try to envision a positive turn of events, what that might look like. And if you see an opportunity in your local community to make that happen, do it. Don't assume it's over. The game isn't over. Uh, until a giant asteroid does hit us, we still got cards left in the deck. And so wash your hands. Be careful. Black lives matter. And if you're going to go stand by them, make sure that you, you're there for them, not your own agenda. Excuse me. Make sure that you're there to stand with them and not to be angry and push your own agenda. Uh, if you're a cop, call out your brother's when they're crossing the line because a cop who kills is not standing behind the thin blue line and if you're a politician or a person in power it's time you started using that for something other than just pushing the ball along an even gradient you need to see change in your community and if you want to see change in your community don't write off politics as a path you can still protest you might get maced even there was a congresswoman who, who got pepper sprayed in New York, I think it was. 
But local government is probably the best way to change and address a lot of the problems we see. It's hard, but if there were more of like mind fighting against uh, corruption and capitalism and blind adherence to the letter of the law that isn't inevitably adhered to, there would probably be more progress. I think it's duly noted, Obama was not perfect. Big disappointment in certain specs, too much of a hawk for my liking, and too much, too willing to concil uh, be conciliatory. But he left a couple of really important legacies behind that got scrapped and ignored by those who followed. A uh, comprehensive plan to how to deal with pandemics, and a comprehensive plan on how to address police violence and race issues in local communities. And both got chucked by the following administration. And I think the comprehensive plan for policing, that was really more on local cops to pay attention to, but a lot of them weren't forced to. So it's up to local politicians to pick those plans up and say, hey, you have to. Notice how Minnesota, I think it's Minnesota, right? Yeah, is seriously talking about actually restructuring, disband disbanding their current police and restructuring that entire system. Not that you can go without any kind of policing, but you certainly don't need one that's bigger than your local social infrastructure. Here in Montreal, we pay something like $600 million for policing and less than uh, $10 million for public housing and poverty. Something wrong with that. Uh, it's worse in some cities. I know, mil I know it's billions in New York. Cops aren't the solution to problems. Uh, cops aren't necessarily all evil, but there are cultural infrastructures that encourage some of the worst behavior. And if we're going to have community policing, it actually has to be community policing. Police from the community policing the community. Uh, outsiders who don't understand it, don't appreciate it, and are bigoted aren't going to help. And that is often the problem. That and the fact that police are usually used as a shield for the powers that be rather than actually support for the people. That's also a problem. Um, Hopefully, things will get better. But if you don't imagine a future where they are, it's not going to happen. It's not all on you as an individual, but as a collective thing, if we're not imagining a better outcome, it's not going to happen. We have to talk about it. We have to think about it. We have to spend less time screaming at people we don't agree with and more time proposing workable solutions. Sorry, is that political? Oh, that's too bad. Take it easy.